Long as I'm the number one, I don't care who come after. When I came from Africa, they come What's up, people? Welcome back to the BCMA podcast. That's the Black Clover Martial Arts Podcast. It's your boy, Lucky from Lucky's Muay Thai. This is episode number 88. In this episode, we're going to talk about, obviously, the thing everybody else has been talking about. That's UFC 300. And did it live up to the hype? Obviously, everybody's talking about Max's knockout, Pereira's knockout, and Jiri's finish. But other than that, there are some other little things that people talked about and people didn't talk about that I guess matter. Um, but first, if you like the show, keep the like, hit the subscribe button, pass it along to a friend. Please leave a comment below. Uh, it helps us grow. Also, if you want to stop by the gym, hit us up www.luckysmt.com. We have a youth program starting uh, next month. We have a fantastic Muay Thai program, an awesome jiu-jitsu program run by Roberto Carrero. You can hit him up at Carrero BJJ on Instagram. And we want to get you started, man, in your Muay Thai fitness jiu-jitsu journey. Uh, we want to get your kids started. Um, we're growing so rapidly and we're just trying to expand and like really reach out um, so that we can anchor ourselves in the, into the community. Um, it's been like one of my nonstop things that I talk about. And that's that we're not just selling this as a martial art. We're selling like a family. We're selling like love. It's like, it's not what you think. We're not just like kicking the hell out of you and you kicking the hell out of us or whatever the case may be. We're actually here to try to help each other get better um, in martial arts, or Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, whatever the case may be, but also just uh, as a place you can get away and a place where you can feel really comfortable with um, good people around you. So if you want to be around good people and enjoy learning some cool ass Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, hit us up www.luckysmt.com. We'll be waiting to get you started. Okay. UFC 300. Did it live up to the hype? Yeah, I guess it did. I mean, everybody is, going crazy about this Max Holloway knockout, which is true. It was amazing. Um, the Let's talk about the bonuses first. The bonuses were Jiri because he did great against Ray Kitchy. I mean, I think he came back from a couple of things. He got cracked on his jaw and literally just dropped and stood right back up. It was the, I mean, the dude's a beast. So shouts to Jiri on his 300. Um, obviously, Max got a double bonus 600,000 Gaethje got 300k which is dope because he's he really laid it out there man to be honest because I guess we'll get to that in a second but let's just talk about the other stuff first because I want to I kind of want to talk about that um Zhang Wei Li fought she defended her title Eh, Bo Nickel uh, he won but you know I don't I don't still get why they're, they're keeps they keep setting him up like this Cody Brundage is 10 and six, good experience, all that. But like Bo Nickel needs somebody that's going to really make him have to like up his game for real. Um, Aljamain Sterling, a bit of a snoozer, but he handled his business. Kayla Harrison beats Holly Holm. She is a two-time Olympic gold medalist judo player. Holly Holm is a 40-year-old former champion, former boxing champion, but like really has a lot of miles and basically on her way out. And I don't think that it's a negative thing to say because Holly Holmes amazing. And maybe it's a great step for Kayla to see if she can make the weight on time and then actually get in there and see how she felt. So this is maybe, this may have been a perfect step up for her as far as like going to the UFC in this way. The end of that though, she didn't call out Amanda and I don't know what she thinks is going to happen because there's not really many, there's not really many women out there in the UFC that, they could line up where it's really going to be worth her time. Like she really needs Amanda to come back. She needs kind of needs cyborg to come back. She needs some things to happen to really make some money, like really, really make it. So, you know, shouts to her for beating up Holly home, but you know, um, what else happened? Let's see. Charles Oliveira started out really well and then got cold in the second round. Armand Sarukian did a great job of like staying with him, staying with him, staying out of trouble when he needed to be out of trouble. And then when he got the takedown, he did the right things. You know, he fought up some, fought off submission attempts, landed some good ground and pounded moments. And in the third round, at the end of the round, 
Charles Oliveira gets a Darce position, but they're both belly down and Charles Oliveira starts sticking out his tongue. Like, I don't know where he didn't, I don't know what just happened because I think he was going to go in there and like really do some damage. And then he went in there and then he gets a position with some seconds left that he could potentially have tried to finish and allowed Armand Sarukian in a bad position to sort of fight off that and fight that off. And then it just closed it like that. So it was congrats to Armand, but like Charles Oliveira, where were you, bro? Where were you? So let's talk really quick about Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. Max Holloway fought a very, very intelligent fight. He's just footwork to get in and out. He did work the body of Gaethje. At the end of the first round, Gaethje went to close the distance at the cage and Max had hit him with the spinning kick. And as Gaethje does and had done throughout the fight, ducked down inside and the spinning kick caught him directly across the inside of the nose, clearly broke his nose. And um, it was sort of downhill after that. His nose was pouring blood. It was solid, solidly broken, I guess, because the blood never stopped really flowing. And then, not to knock the wind, but let's let's just bring it up because it happened. Max poked him in the eye with, in his left eye, and then Max poked him in his right eye. And I'm not saying that had any effect on anything. All I'm just saying is, once he took the shot to the nose, you're already going to have some vision problems because your eyes are going to be a little watery. But then you get poked and you get poked again. I think Gaethje showed something that people don't often notice about fighters, real ones. They will ignore the fact that they can't see out of both eyes and still go out there and show their heart. And I think Gaethje did that. And for him to go in the middle of that thing, like he had to take the chance, right? That was his chance to win swing with Max. Hopefully he clipped him, but Max was really prepared for that. And he's a little longer, at least his body is longer. So it just works out well to his advantage. And when he caught Justin Gaethje with basically it was like two seconds left. And by the time the ref stepped, it was one second. It was one of the most amazing finishes of all time. I think what happens is the, the MMA has so many fantastic, you can watch crazy finishes almost every freaking weekend from fights all over the world. But because this is on such a, a huge stage, I think people believe like things, these things never happen or they don't happen that often, but they kind of did. I mean, if you look at that night, Chael Sonnen got put into the UFC Hall of Fame and the video production they did was all about uh, his fight with Anderson Silva. And it was how Anderson Silva pulled the triangle out with seconds left to go, like two seconds, three seconds, to tap Chael after getting beat up the same way. Four relating. It was almost even more impressive because Max wasn't getting beat up. Max was doing the beating up. But in Anderson Silva versus Chael, Chael was beating the shit out of Anderson Silva, literally until the very last second. And this is something that happens in the MMA sphere it just happens a lot because there's just so many ways for you to lose a fight, win a fight, whatever. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing knockout one second, but there's a lot of first, like a couple of seconds in knockouts and, you know, right before the end of the fight, somebody pulls something out. So to that, I say, fucking A, Max Holloway, you deserve the 600. J- Gaethje, des- Gaethje deserved the 300. And they really were the excitement. Well, the highlight of the 300 event. Everybody says that it was an amazing event to be at and it looked like it was an amazing event. And it was also cool just to have uh, so many fighters that I said were interesting. Like I think what the UFC managed to do and whether it was, I don't know if that was on purpose, was they were able to put a bunch of fighters that people are basically interested in. They may not know a lot about, but they're interested in. And I think it opens up doors for them to be able to promote these fighters better in the future. And I hope the fighters take advantage of the fact that they have this platform and they were put on this show because you may not get a chance to do this again. So you got to build on whatever you did get, right? You got to get a little rub and use that to move forward. All right. Last one, Alex Pereira over Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill is great, man. But Alex Pereira, uh, just, I don't even... He's a different animal. And like, 
I don't think Jamal Hill was prepared to, to be heavy. And when I say heavy, I mean throw heavy shots in the first round. I feel like he was trying to find his, his range, distance, timing, read, all that stuff was happening. And Pereira was, was hunting. And I think Jamal Hill threw, you know, when he threw that little bouncy kick that, that landed on his cup and whatever, trying to go to the body, Pereira had already seen the, the end forthcoming, which is why Herb Dean went to step in and Pereira was like, no, 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 I'm good. Because I think he already realized that he had Jamal Hill in a place where he wasn't sure yet his range and all that. And he wasn't throwing anything hard enough to make Pereira have to keep it honest. So he threw a sort of fainting, like a cross in there. I don't know if it even landed. It was just fast. And then he left hook off of that. And as you know, it doesn't have to hit you clean. It just has to touch you. And Jamal Hill, you know, went bug eyed and then took a few hammer fists and it was all over. And, um, to be honest, you know, if Pereira wants to fight at heavyweight, I don't know, man, like I'm not in here to choose anybody's careers or whatever, but he was two thirty that the night of the fight, could he fight at heavyweight? Yes. I don't know if I'd want to fight in a month at heavyweight, but that is Alex Pereira. And he's been doing amazing things ever since he got into the UFC. He was on a revenge uh, mission for Israel Adesanya. And now, with Jamal Hill out of the way, that was his revenge mission as Jamal Hill beat um, Glover Teixeira. And Alex Pereira's revenge shit is like John Wick level. So I would not try to piss him off and think seven, eight years down the road, you're going to be able to get away with it because you're probably not. He's going to find you. Um, all that being said, listen, the fights. Were, oh, really quick. This is how long I've been watching. Like Alex Pereira is amazing. And he comes from that Glover Teixeira ilk. But what people may not realize about Glover Teixeira is he comes from that Chuck Iceman Liddell ilk. Because back in the day, they used to get trained by John Hackleman, who used to own a place called The Pit. And The Pit was just crazy workouts, man. They're pulling, pushing wheelbarrows up and down hills, crazy shit. And he was Chuck Liddell's coach. Main coach, head coach, whatever you want to call it. And they had this place where they trained. And back in the day, I bought a video called The Pit Workouts. It was like a three-disc um, situation. And also on that video was Glover Teixeira and he was meant to be the next big thing. And he got because of immigration issues or whatever, got sent back to Brazil for seven years. And so you got to see maybe a version of Glover Teixeira that wasn't even the most fantastic version of him because you got to miss seven years of him fighting in the UFC or with major, major competition. And once he got back, I mean, look, he won the title. So for for me to know that I've watched these different levels and generations of people and that I remember like where all these people sort of came from and started, it's fantastic. I love having a little bit of history and, and understanding of these things because I think when you have conversations about fighting with people, you should have some historic background and some things to be able to back up the conversation. It makes the conversation much more interesting than just throwing out, you know, how something made you feel or opinions. Although those things do matter. Sometimes it's the feel and like maybe the UFC 300, a card didn't feel good. Wasn't. Mm. And then you're like, Oh, they got Jamal Hill late, whatever the case may be, but did it deliver what it needed to do? And that's entertainment and excitement to the fans. It absolutely did. Um, so shout out to them. Obviously, one of the greatest. The best is blessed. Um, that being said, yo, next week I'll try to hit you. Next week I'll try to hit you up again with another one because there's some boxing going on. Nate Diaz is fighting Masvidal in boxing. We have uh, Devin Haney versus Ryan Garcia. I mean, I might come back and talk a little bit more about Tyson and Jake Paul just because that's happening uh, in some way. We still don't know what, really what the fuck's going on. We just keep seeing videos. But anyway, I'll be back to talk about that next week. If you like the show, keep the like, hit the subscribe button, drop a comment below. If you want to stop by the gym, hit me up, www.luckysmt.com. You know what it is. I love y'all. When the system's been set up by racists trying to kill them. I just want to live my life and make a couple million.